Okay, everybody. Wow, this is great. We've got such a great turnout today. I'm Carmen Milankovic. I'm the executive director of the Saskatchewan Craft Council. And I'm really great, uh, gratified that you've taken time out of your Sunday and a beautiful day it looks to be in Saskatchewan anyway, uh, to join us in this discussion about trends and opportunities in our industry. And uh, the we have with us um, Bernard Burton and Greg Tool, who I'll introduce in a few minutes. But first, I want to welcome Aaron Dean, who is the CEO of Creative Saskatchewan. Uh, Aaron, Creative Saskatchewan and Western Economic Diversification are the sponsors of this event. They're why you can join and not have any costs associated with it. And uh, so, Aaron, do you have anything you'd like to say to the group? Um, just welcome to day two, and uh, we're really happy that we can put this on at no charge after the year everyone's had. Free workshops are the best workshops. Um, and thanks to Bernard and Greg for a great day yesterday. I learned a lot, and I know some of the comments, it's like it's a little daunting, but we'll figure it out and um, just keep learning about exporting and these opportunities that are available to you. So thanks to um, everyone for showing up today and thanks, big thanks to Carmen and her team at the Craft Council for helping to pull this all together. And I just want to uh, welcome our colleagues from British Columbia, Alberta and Manitoba who are joining us. Uh, welcome. We are very pleased that you could take advantage of this wonderful knowledge of Greg and um, Bernard. So uh, with that, I'll gonna, I'm going to just introduce um, Bernard and Greg. For those of you who didn't meet them yesterday, they are both working with um, Craft Alliance Atlantic in Halifax, which is, um, well, maybe I'll let you describe what you do better than I can. Uh, so welcome Bernard and Greg. Thank you. <clears throat> So before we get into everything that we do and, and into the presentation, we want to start by welcoming, welcoming everybody uh, from wherever you're joining us from and uh, offer a land acknowledgement for the space that we're all uh, occupying and uh, working in Craft Alliance. We're a Pan-Atlantic Association based in Nigmagi, Nova Scotia. And our mandate is to support the growth of craftspeople working on the ancestral and unceded territories of Indigenous people across Atlantic Canada. Uh, but we recognize that we're you know, being joined on this call today by people across uh, Saskatchewan, uh, British Columbia, Alberta, possibly Manitoba. And we just want to acknowledge that uh, all of those lands are treaty lands and traditional territories of Indigenous peoples. And so, uh, you know, I, I outlined some of them that uh, I was aware of in, in Saskatchewan, uh, the Assiniboine, Cree, Dene, Dakota, Salto, and homeland of the Métis. And we also acknowledge the historical oppression of lands, cultures, and of the original peoples in what we know as Canada. We respect and affirm the inherent and the treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples encourage all our clients and partners to explore the fundamental impact that First Nations craftsmanship has on the craft traditions that we enjoy today. Uh, and we just want to affirm that, you know, each of us in our work and our personal lives has a responsibility to consider our relationship to colonialism and the persisting impacts on First Nations communities that it has. And by continuing to educate ourselves we know that each individual has uh, the capacity to develop their own path for approaching reconciliation and decolonization. And just to remember that we're all treaty people and together that our individual and our collective efforts, no matter how big or how, how small can have an impact. So thank you. Thank you, Greg, that was great. So I'm Bernard Burton and I'm executive director of Crop Alliance Atlantic. And as Carmen mentioned, we are a pan-Atlantic trade association based in Halifax. And our main focus is wholesale market development and exporting, um, though you will see through this presentation that we work in many different elements and aspects of the craft community. Um, and um, so in this presentation, 
We just want to demonstrate that um, there are lots of opportunities for craft, Canadian craftspeople across the country. And it's a matter of considering the type and style of work that you're producing and your personal goals in terms of how you would like to evolve as um, a craftsperson and studio practice or business. Um, and so what we're going to do in this presentation is show you um, a bunch of samples through project activity that we've completed as an organization in the past couple of years. And then we'll also talk more generally about some trends. And I know that there's been a, a, re a renewed interest uh, in especially Saskatchewan in art licensing. And that's an area that we actually have a lot of experience in. So at, at, towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to specifically talk about what that is and how it works. So I'd like to start off just by giving people some scale and scope in terms of the size of the craft sector. So in Canada, it's approximately a $2.8 billion sector, that's with a B. Uh, and there's approximately about 400 million dollars in exports. So exporting in Canada for the craft community uh, is a big thing and um, it, it can be done. We've got lots of great success stories that we can talk about, um, but it, it's not insurmountable for a small scale producer uh, to be exporting. Uh, in Canada, um, you know, you're, some of you are members of the Saskatchewan Craft Council, maybe Manitoba Craft Council, Alberta Craft Council, uh, the Craft Council of British Columbia. Um, and these are all considered the professional craft organizations within the individual provinces. And those organizations are also supported on a national level by the Canadian Crafts Federation. Currently, there's about over 729,000 cultural workers in Canada, of which everyone in the craft community is part of the cultural community. If anybody's interested in cultural statistics, in the last 10 years, um, Statistics Canada has been working to improve data on cultural uh, collection of sales, revenue, um, and sort of the size and scale of what's happening uh, in culture. And, and there are craft statistics as part of that. It's referred to as the cultural satellite account, and you can reference that on the Statistics Canada website. When we look to exporting specifically, and we're going to give lots of exporting examples of things we've done, um, I'd like to point out that the U.S. craft sector is about a $50 billion sector in the United States. So obviously, when you're, as an organization like Craft Alliance, when we're looking um, to expand markets, we usually, because we're based in Atlanta, Canada, we like to start people off and grow their business within your home province. Um, our region of Atlantic Canada, and then we move people into Central Canada, Western Canada, and obviously if they have the potential to become an exporter, then we start looking at markets within the United States. And you can see by that number of 50 billion that the United States is a, a very um, a large market with lots of opportunities um, that we can pursue. The arts sector, which includes a fine art, visual art, craft, uh, and many other elements of the arts, is about a $764 billion sector uh, in the United States. So the $50 billion is a, a small part um, of the overall um, ecosystem that exists in the U.S. market. I also like to point out to people when you're talking about opportunities, about all the organizations I mentioned, the Craft Councils and the Canadian Crafts Federation, but obviously you have a great funding partner here in Saskatchewan with Creative Saskatchewan, and there are similar organizations uh, in all the provinces across Canada. Uh, and they take various different forms of either creative agencies, cultural industries agencies, or maybe arts councils. Um, we've also just taken on involvement in the World Craft Council, which I will give you some more information about. It's also important, I think, as professional makers that people look to their professional single media organization. So if you're a potter or ceramist, then you really should be a member of NSICA in the United States. Um, if you're a metalsmith, you should be a member of SNAG or other Canadian 
or provincial metal arts guilds, because that becomes sort of your individual industry um, resource that becomes uh, very important for you in terms of lifelong learning and education. Local business development agencies, so chambers of commerce and other national or regional organizations like the LGBT Chambers of Commerce, Aboriginal Business Canada. There's many other resources like that across the country. Craft galleries and retailers that you're working with can be a really valuable resource in terms of information and feedback on what's happening um, with retail sales and generally in the industry. You're very lucky in Saskatchewan to have an organization called SAS Galleries, which um, brings together all the uh, commercial galleries in the province to um, provide information about what's happening in that sector. Educational institutions are obviously very important and also continuing education and lifelong learning. So utilizing the resources of all those organizations, the professional organizations that you can belong to, but also residency programs and traveling to other specialized schools um, on the East Coast, you have Maine, uh, in, you have Haystack uh, School of Craft uh, in Maine, and then you have other places in Ontario, Halliburton, Aramont down in uh, Tennessee. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for you to expand what you're doing um, in terms of opportunities and the market. Um, I like to point out when I talk about trends and the overall craft industry, that there's definitely a difference in how government approaches the craft community and the craft sector in general. Um, the federal government specifically um, tends to divide craft into two areas. So consumer products is a generalized industry sector category, um, which production oriented craft tends to fall in. Um, cultural industries tends to refer to the more artistic side. So if you're doing contemporary one-of-a-kind work, then you would fall under funding that's available through the Canada Council for the Arts. Uh, if you're more production-oriented, then there may be a provincial or other program um, that you would qualify for under that. So there is a definite, we don't look at it as a divide. Um, we look at every individual craftsperson and maker um, on their individual merits as to you know, what their approach is and what personal direction they would like to take. But I think it's something that craftspeople need to be aware of that you know, if you wanna do trade shows in the United States, you're not gonna get funding from the Canada Council because um, trade shows would be more production oriented. If you wanted to do an exhibition in the United States, then obviously the Canada Council would be the place to go. Um, there's lots of uh, strategic plans, reports, and studies that have been done over the years. Um, the Canadian Cross Federation actually has um, an advocacy and research, research component to their website where you can find uh, lots of information. Trade publications, so newsletters and information and surveys that are published by organizations like uh, and SICA and Metal Arts Guild and so on uh, would be great resources. Um, federal government and provincial government funding sources. So I just list um, different places you can look for different opportunities. Um, I'm not going to go through those in all detail. Uh, this presentation, by the way, is very long and I'm going to get to a lot of photos in a minute. So um, we are recording the presentation. So at some point, if you miss something, we can uh, you can easily go back and refer to it uh, in the future. So how do we work in terms of industry development? So basically we do research into markets. Um, we usually go to those markets and investigate them before we initiate project activity. Um, usually they take the form of what we call educational missions um, or trade missions. And so we will go to a market. If it's, if it's wholesale, we'll go look at a wholesale trade show whether that's in Canada or the US or abroad. Uh, and the same for contemporary art and craft. Uh, maybe we'll go to an art fair um, or a conference or an event where we can gather that market intelligence information and then bring that back and share it. And then 
you know, share that with our colleagues in the craft community to see, you know, is there interest and, you know, would we have success if we attempted to move into some of those new markets or, or new opportunities? Um, I mentioned the Canada Council for the Arts. Um, if you're interested in digital technology, the Canada Council in the last three years has launched what's called the Digital Strategy Fund. Um, so there are dozens and dozens of digital strategy projects going on across the country. So it's really, to you can go to the Canada Council website. There's a whole section on digital strategy and you can actually see um, some of the projects and activity that are going on across the country. Craft Alliance is currently working on a two-year project and it's called Global Craft Markets Navigating Pathways to Success. Uh, it's a two-year research project that we're doing. We're not even a third into it yet. Uh, but we're getting there. Uh, COVID has really uh, caused problems in terms of doing community engagement and consultations around research. So um, that has kind of slowed us down, but there's some really exciting things happening across the country around right now in digital strategy development. And I think in the next year or so, you're gonna see start seeing a lot of the results of that uh, which could be really beneficial as we go forward. Our end game is to develop a global export marketing strategy for craftspeople, whether you're doing production or one of a kind. Um, basically, we're going to create a framework around considerations and how do you go about doing it. Uh, that's our goal at the end. Um, I mentioned the World Craft Council. Uh, the World Craft Council is an international nonprofit organization. There are often opportunities offered through that organization. There are five continental regions of the World Craft Council, and we are part of the North American region. Uh, in December of 2020, uh, the Canadian Crafts Federation and Craft Alliance Atlantic have taken over the leadership of World Craft Council of North America. For many years, um, that leadership was in the United States, and there, there hasn't been much activity happening. Um, so Megan Black at the Canadian Cross Federation and myself said, we need to do something about this because if we're trying to do international activity uh, and we're not part of this global organization, um, then there's kind of a missing piece there. So we have a Facebook page up and there's an international organization website. We will have a, uh, a World Craft Council website up in the coming weeks. That's uh, just being worked on at the moment. So in terms of um, market, we sort of call this niche market development. So when we're doing exploratory activity into new area or region, like I said, we do educational missions to start off. So here's these, this is just sort of an ongoing list. I'm gonna go through these and demonstrate some of them. It's interesting to point out, um, and it's something a lot of people don't think about that much because you know, if you're working, if you're a craftsperson and you're working in your studio and you're making work, um, you're kind of focused on that. But it's interesting, one of the, the second last item on my list is service sector. This, in, if you're not familiar with the service sector in Canada, service sector is all about selling expertise. So in the service sector right now, we have environmental technology, we have ocean technology, we have life sciences, we have biotech, we have information technology. So there's all these industry categories where people are selling their expertise uh, to other countries around the world. And we really feel strongly that in Canada, we have many, many experts in the craft sector and we should be selling that expertise. Currently right now in Canada, the number one largest area of export development is the service sector. Um, and it's starting to return the biggest dollars as well. So I think with all the art colleges and all the, the many experienced craftspeople we have in this country, we should be selling our technology, selling our expertise around the world. And that's gonna be one of our goals as part of the World Craft Council organization is to explore that whole concept even further. Um, so Craft Alliance Atlantic, we produce trade shows, we do market events. Um, we've had a very well-known trade show that has existed on the East Coast, Crafties Buyers Expo. It used to be called the Atlantic Craft Trade Show. Uh, four years ago, we developed a web portal 
And this was the, with this sort of idea of, we need to get ready for the onslaught of technology. And uh, in late 2019, early 2020, uh, we were already contemplating creating some kind of uh, an extended virtual space. So we created our portal mainly as a way to develop our trade show. Uh, it does registration, it does product review and jurying, and it handles all our credit card and, and invoicing track track transactions. Um, so in early 2020, when the pandemic was uh, coming down upon us about uh, I don't know about the rest of the country, but it actually today is the, the one year anniversary um, of declaring a state of emergency here in, Atlanta, in Nova Scotia. Um, so we started the process of sort of evolving our portal. And um, in the spring and summer last year, we actually turned our portal into a virtual marketplace. So retailers can now log on to our portal from anywhere in the world and place orders wholesale um, from producers in Atlantic Canada. So that's sort of been an ongoing project for a while now. So I'm gonna start with wholesale market development. I'll talk about some of the wholesale and then we'll get into some uh, contemporary art fairs and what we're doing in that market. So since 2014, we've been working in New York. Um, it used to be called the New York International Gift Fair. It's now called New York Now. Um, and we do that trade show now twice a year. It happens the end of January and uh, in August. Um, and it's very large. It's one of the largest giftware trade shows in the US. It usually gets somewhere between 35,000 and 40,000 buyers over a five day period. There are about 2 million square feet of craft and giftware. And it, the show is subdivided into multiple categories. Now, if you were in our presentations yesterday, you saw that Saskatchewan Craft Council has been doing wholesale trade in Toronto and Craft Alliance has been doing a similar type activity. In New York, we have not done a showcase style booth. Uh, in New York, what we do is we access federal funding and we assist each individual with having their own booth space at this trade show. And the reason we do that is that in 2014, when we first started this process, um, we discovered that the trade show was so large and has such a diverse range of, of wholesale buyers that you really need to be in the right section, in the right aisle to engage with the right type of buyer because uh, this show has a handmade section. So obviously all the people who are handmade gravitate towards that section of the show. However, um, if your product crosses over into other areas like home decor or housewares or kitchenware, um, then you, you're most likely probably missing some buyers. So we felt it was really important when we, on the onset of doing this trade show, that we make sure that every individual producer that goes to this event, that they're in the appropriate section. And uh, so we've done a lot of research in that. Generally, we have six to eight companies uh, every time we go. Uh, and sales can be significant. Um, we're seeing between a quarter of a million and we've had some shows up as high as 450,000 in wholesale orders at that event. Um, but it, you know, it's not everybody. It, you know, it's gotta be the right product. Uh, in the right price, uh, in the right location. So um, there's a lot of things that go into that in terms of product categories. Um, the interesting thing about these shows is that um, you generally walk away with more sort of pre-qualified leads than you do orders. So we've had people go and get 20, 25 orders at the show, but they walk away with 100 leads. And you need to follow up with every one of those leads because chances are those buyers are looking for something very specific from you. So those are sort of some key elements of what happens at the trade show. Uh, this is the Javits Center in New York. It's on Midtown West in Manhattan. Um, this building currently during COVID has been a COVID emergency hospital and vaccination center. Hopefully it's gonna to return to trade shows in the next month or so. Here are some booths of some of our exhibitors. 
the basic spirit pewter and David Steppen designs who does uh, woodworking and copper work. So you'll see this is a wholesale trade show. So David compared to, to basic spirit has very few items. Basic spirit is a pewter company which has upwards of 400 products in their product range. Whereas David Ste Steppen is a sole producer um, and he's doing um, wood cutting boards and he also does metal smithing and does a, a line of copper utensils. So you see there's two very differing types of presentations and booths. Um, so, you know, this type of opportunity is open to many different types of wholesalers. This is another Nova Scotia company who does, works with fair trade uh, producers in Nepal and India, and um, they're all her own designs. And um, she has the materials produced uh, in Nepal, and then they're all constructed and finished uh, in Canada. This is a um, jewelry designer from uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, and her brand name is called Dory Blue. The company is called Sparks Design, and um, she's specifically doing a line of silver jewelry with Labradorite, which is unique to Labrador um, and Newfoundland and Labrador. So she's created a line of jewelry, and um, she's now wholesaling that across Canada and into the United States as well. An interesting thing there, you'll see, um, I don't have a lot of images of, of jewelry displays, um, but if you're familiar with doing trade shows in Canada, um, a lot of people at, with jewelry will do tabletop type displays, but in the US tabletop is at chest height. So you see those tables are sitting at about 45 inches from the ground. Um, whereas a normal table height is usually 29 or 30 inches. So it's, it's a slight difference in how people like to present the work in, in the U.S. market. Bernie, somebody yes. just asked if for New York now, do you, are you required to have a walled booth or you, you have to either rent it from them or bring your own, right? Um, it depends on which section of the show. Right. <laughs> That's a complicated question. So uh, for example, in the handmade section, handmade has um, three or four different levels of booth. So you can buy booth space that's just literally concrete on the ground and you put up hard walls, you carpet it, you wire it, you light it yourself. Um, they do have a limited number of booths that are um, different sizes. So like a six by 12 foot booth, and it comes with um, a wall and lighting, and you can even buy one that like jewelry, uh, a lot of the jewelry designers um, will buy a handmade booth package that includes a glass enclosed display cabinet. Um, so there are different um, formats um, and that those different, formats are unique to handmade. And then when you go to another part of the show, there could be some other offerings. So every section and every category is handled a little bit differently. I don't think you can see, um, yeah, you can't really see the back of, she's got a pop-up, that um, Dory Blue sign that I'm showing there is actually a pop-up booth. Um, behind that is a wall structure that the show has provided, but it's not hard wall. It's actually a fabric, but it's not pipe and drape. It's actually pulled tight. Um, so it's on a steel frame. The steel frame is not round, it's rectangular aluminum. And they put a fabric, a fire retardant fabric, I should say, and it's pulled tight. So you can literally bounce a quarter off it um, because the fabric is so tight. So different packages for different sections of the show. So. Um, but you can usually um, access um, exhibitor manuals and information on their website. Um, but that's a very good question. And it's handled differently for everything. Sometimes you can get a booth package with lighting. Other times you have to rent the lighting separately. Um, the thing about wholesale trade shows, especially in the US market, and I mentioned this in the wholesale workshop yesterday morning, is that many of the trade and convention centers in the United States are union uh, managed facilities. So all the staff are union members. 
So you literally um, cannot pick up a hammer um, or a power drill of any kind. You can't get up on a ladder. Um, you're supposed to hire somebody to install your lighting. Now there's, you know, there's some issues around there and there are a few exceptions. Um, the bigger the booth you have at a show like that. So you have a, a 20 by a 10 by 20 booth or something. Um, you're probably going to have to hire a contractor to put your booth up, even, even if you bring your own booth. So there's a lot of tricks. That's one of the reasons why we don't have a showcase because we discovered that if you do a showcase, and you need a booth that's like 20 by 20 or 20 by 30 feet, suddenly you're into tens of thousands of dollars in costs because of the fact that um, you're having to hire their unionized labor at $100 an hour uh, US dollars uh, to actually do that for you. Uh, but there's ways around that. We've, we've found ways around some of these rules and regulations and that's by keeping your booth smaller and um, you know, if you can buy a package that includes carpet and lighting, then it's a good idea to do that because then you don't have to deal with it uh, upon arrival. Um, so um, product, uh, product categories at New York, um, there is high-end design. There are, there's handmade, there's handmade designer maker, there's global design, um, there's emerging sections. So, um, there's a lot of different categories. So if anybody's interested in that market, we can give you lots of information about what to do and what not to do in that market. Uh, in, 20, in uh, 2019, they started amalgamating some other smaller shows into the New York gift show. So the National Stationery Show is now part of New York now. And the Certex Art Licensing Trade Show is now also part of New York now. Uh, Certex used to be part of the International Contemporary Furniture Show, which I am gonna show you some information on as we go forward. We've also done some export missions. The last one we did was in August, 2018 on an educational mission to New York. So we had our exhibitors there, but we also brought new exporters. So um, at that time, we bring a group of people, we hire a consultant in the market. The consultant organizes a two or three day uh, experience for all the participants. Um, it usually in call, in, um, involves some workshops, uh, walking the trade show, meeting Canadian exhibitors at the trade show to learn about uh, what's happening. And then we usually always try to include some other outside of the trade show activity. So a shopping tour, a gallery tour, a museum tour, whatever is relevant uh, to the group of people that we're working with at that time. And in 2020, we're now into virtual trade shows. Um, so everything. Uh, in 2020, uh, starting back in April uh, of last year, uh, pretty well every trade show went virtual up until about the fall. And then some U.S. areas started to reopen their trade shows. In the southern U.S., even when the pandemic was raging at, you know, five and 7,000 new cases a day in Florida and Texas, they were still hosting trade shows, uh, which I think is a little bit crazy. But uh, we weren't there um, because the Canadian border is closed and we can't go there. Um, so we started migrating to the virtual platforms. I won't get into a lot of detail about it because you know that's a we could do a whole other workshop on digital events and digital environments. But suffice it to say, every trade show that's out there has got a virtual version now. Uh, New York is called New York Now Digital, and they're all employing some kind of platform where you have a profile and you engage with buyers on the platform uh, and hopefully that leads to sales. So this, uh, the first one was back in September uh, that we participated in. Uh, we did New York Now and we did Toronto and they were an absolute dismal failure. Um, I think those trade shows learned a lot last September, October and they spent um, the last quarter of the year figuring out Okay, we normally have trade shows in January, February, March, what are we going to do? And so they spent a lot of time figuring out where are we going to go with this. So this is an image of New York Down Digital. This is Jennifer from Fibers of Life. So this is what a producer profile looks like. That opening image there is actually a video. She did a three minute video talking about her product um, and what type of buyer buys her product. Um, 
here's another profile. This is Hammer Threads. This is just from last month. We did the uh, February shows, and this is a New Brunswick uh, leather company. So this is what a standard in most virtual environments. This is what a standard producer profile looks like, and you can see by all the tabs across the dashboard there. Um, you can search projects. Uh, there's agendas. You can book meetings. Uh, you can interact with the buyers on some level. Every platform is different, and you got to learn the platform. Um, New York Now, you could actually do instant messaging, and there was even a tab where you could do an instant video call. Not all platforms are like that. Toronto, you could not do that. Um, so you really have to investigate. If you're going to do virtual events, make sure you investigate them and learn their process first. So this slide, these are all screenshots I took during the New York event last month. And um, so this is the buyer view. So I found a retailer that I know personally, and I said, I need you to register me because normally I, I can't register as a retailer because I'm not a retailer. So she graciously uh, registered me under her business name. So I was able to have a profile and I was able to uh, sort of sleuth the buyer side. So this is what a buyer would see that buyers, you see my name up in the right corner there, uh, Bernard. Um, so buyers also have their profiles and dashboards and they can track producers, they can download catalogs and price lists. Um, and then you can interact, like I said, with messaging or video calls, or you can actually book a timed meeting on this particular platform. Um, but what a buyer sees is basically a scrolling, this is a scrolling page of hundreds and hundreds of items. And you'll see that I, in the middle there, there's two Fibers of Life products. Um, and you can actually click on that and it'll take you to the profile and then you can start engaging with that producer. There's also a brand page and um, these are paid brand listings. So you'll see that Fibers of Life actually paid to have herself posted on the branding page. Um, so that's another way that you become discoverable uh, to retailers that's searching on the platform. You can see the filters that are down the left-hand side of the page. Uh, you can search by product category, type, brand. Um, anybody that's, it says digital market deals, anybody that's got a show special, uh, sustainable brands. So the whole eco-friendly, zero waste environment, that has become a huge sector unto itself in all the wholesale trade shows. So you can actually search out and seek out those people. Showrooms and sales reps. Um, so if a retailer is dealing with a specific sales rep that carries various brands, they can actually contact them directly. Um, that can also be used by producers if they're looking to find a sales rep on their own. Uh, the America's Mart in Atlanta is another project that we initiated uh, in uh, 2018, 2019. Um, so this, is, this building is called a merchandise mart. So these are buildings all over the United States where sales reps have permanent showrooms and sales repping in the United States is huge. Um, there are thousands and thousands of sales reps, as you can tell, just by this one building. This is a center right downtown Atlanta. It's called the America's Mart Merchandise Mart. It is three office towers taking up a whole city block. Uh, they're 18 to 22 stories tall, and they are filled with craft, giftware, home decor, anything a retailer would want to fill their store. Um, so these centers, these merchandise mart centers, they host quarterly pop-up shows. So the picture on the right there is a picture of a booth and um, the picture on the right um, is just an overview shot uh, looking across the atrium of the building. So they'll do temporaries and you can rent booth space on various floors within the building. Um, so we took a group uh, there in August 2019 uh, and started working in that market. We partnered at that show with an organization called the American Museum Shops Association. They were actually renting and subleasing space. And we've been working on developing a partnership 
with this museum association in the US. And so they allowed us to have our own showcase booth um, at the trade show in 2019. Our plan going forward was to do it multiple times in 2020, but that did not happen obviously because of COVID. And there's a couple of the booths. Space Experiment was another one of the companies. Uh, they've actually been doing Atlanta for many years. Uh, and this other on the right is a lip balm company from New Brunswick uh, called Eclair Lips. And she's a new emerging company that was doing it for the first time. So yeah, so there's lots of opportunities. And you know, New York and Atlanta are only two options in the US. There are major sort of key centers uh, in the US. New York, Atlanta, Chicago, uh, Houston, LA, San Francisco are sort of the big ones. And they're kind of, if you look at a map, they're kind of down the coasts and across the South. Um, the sort of central United States, um, there are some smaller regional trade shows, um, but we, we've sort of stayed with the larger entities because we're, gonna, we're going to hopefully see more buyers. Um, we started back in 2016, we joined the Can Gift Association and we started producing uh, what we call Craft Lab, which is our Craft Lab incubator. So we're doing a, a shared booth space, just like uh, the Saskatchewan Craft Council has been doing. Uh, I think they've been doing it a few more years than we have. Uh, but So we started, our first show is in 2017. Um, and we've had really, really good success with this. It's been building and growing as we've gone forward. Um, so far, we've put 36 companies uh, through our showcase, um, several people multiple times. Um, our rule of thumb has kind of been three times and you're out. So, you know, we pay the cost for the first three times. And after three attempts, um, we would like you to move on on your own and maybe get your own booth. Um, and then that's been working. Now, obviously, COVID has interrupted that. And then can gift itself started changing its show uh, format and and the way the building was laid out in 2019. So 2020 has been kind of a write off. Uh, we did do the show in January 2020, and uh, we had actually here's some of the products that we have in our booth there. Um, there's another shot from one of our previous presentations. We actually use the same display company that uh, the Saskatchewan Craft Council uses. And then uh, January of last year, we actually redesigned our booth and we now have a 20, <clears throat> 20 foot by 20 foot um, square booth. And we redesigned it so we could get a few more. We literally have a waiting list for this. So uh, we wanted to sort of reconfigure it so that um, uh, we could hopefully offer the opportunity to more people. Uh, another area that in the, this, um, sort of speaks to niche markets. If you have a product that has some unique element or unique um, story behind it uh, that you can sell into some other product category or market. Uh, I've, quite a while ago, we've actually been working on the Celtic market um, for close to 15 years now. Um, and it was one of the first niche markets that we started to explore and the reason we started exploring it is that Atlantic Canada is actually recognized as one of the larger Celtic uh, destinations in the world. Um, if you look at a map of uh, Celtic countries and people with um, uh, Celtic heritage, um, particularly Scott and Irish, um, then Atlantic Canada is definitely on the map and there's other places in the world, parts of New Zealand, Northern France, obviously the UK, Wales, Scotland and Ireland and Northern Ireland are all part of that. Um, so back in 2005, I guess it was, I went to Ireland thinking uh, naively at the time uh, that uh, I'm gonna go to, so I went on a trade mission to Ireland and I also visited Northern Ireland at the time. And I had meetings with the Irish government and they have a whole craft development division within uh, uh, their government programs. And I met with their people and I met with some retailers, find out what all the key trade shows and 
you know, Bernie's going to take Celtic product to Ireland and let's see what we can do with it. Uh, because we had like this product I'm showing here. Um, we had lots of people in Atlantic Canada that were using Celtic themes and Celtic imagery on their products. So we thought, well, let's explore this and see what happens. And much to my amazement, uh, when I got to Ireland, one of my very first meetings, uh, one of the government representatives gave me a stack of studies and reports that the Irish government had done. And lo and behold, I, we discovered that the largest Celtic market in the world is the United States. And so immediately we went home and said, okay, well, that's easy for us to figure out. We can do that. Uh, and so immediately we joined an organization called the North American Celtic uh, Trade Association, which is, uh, it's based in New Jersey, um, but they produce a trade show in Chicago uh, every year. And um, so we joined that association. There are over at the time in, you know, obviously um, outside of pre-COVID times, uh, there were over a thousand Celtic retail stores uh, just in the continental US. And that's just one Celtic market. We're not even talking about the rest of the planet. Um, so immediately we um, took a membership in the Celtic Trade Association. We went to the Celtic Trade Show. We took Celtic themed product. And at the time, what we did is we also created a Celtic product guide. So it was a pocket guide of every Celtic themed product we could find in Atlantic Canada. And we also create, created at the time a mini CD-ROM uh, that we included with the pocket guide. And we literally mailed that to every single Celtic retailer in the United States, all 1,000 of them. Uh, that was a big mailing and it was a big mail bill, but it returned huge, huge, huge returns um, because, you know, you're, you're basically preaching to the choir. You know, these are retailers that are focused on Celtic product. Yes, they bring a lot of imports over from Scotland and Ireland uh, that are handmade or reproduced. However, finding a Celtic theme product from Canada that was much easier to ship. Um, it qualified under NAFTA, so it was free trade. There was no duty, there was no excise taxes. Uh, so it made it very, very easy for us to jump into that marketplace. Um, so that's been just one really interesting example that really didn't require much work on our part to make it happen because it was sort of readily available. So that could easily be done with things like jewelry and accessories, could either can be done with ceramics, you could do theme-based product guides and you could easily roll that out to specific markets. Uh, in recent years, natural products have become obviously a big element in the market. There are now trade shows. This is one Expo West, um, which is usually based somewhere on the West Coast in California or um, uh, somewhere of that nature. They move this show around <clears throat> on the West Coast. There's also a Expo East, which is usually held um, down in either New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, somewhere in that range uh, on the East Coast of the US. Um, and these shows are not necessarily gift shows. They are just general trade shows with any kind of consumer product. So it could be food products, uh, anything that is natural uh, or eco-friendly. So that becomes a whole other entity and market. And there's many, many, many other examples like this in various different product categories. So that's sort of my little spiel on uh, wholesale trade shows and what we're doing in those markets. Um, for those that are doing contemporary one-of-a-kind work, you may be familiar or have heard of SOFA. Um, Creative Saskatchewan uh, partnered for several years to do uh, an exhibition at SOFA. Um, we've been working at SOFA since uh, 2007. Uh, so it's been quite a long time. Um, and um, back in, uh, so we've been doing educational missions and taking um, craftspeople to experience the event, participate in workshops and lecture series. Um, at, in Chicago, and we've sort of built a whole series of relationships because now we know dozens of gallery owners 
um, and collectors, and we've developed relationships in that market. So it's been very beneficial. We've partnered with the Canadian consulate to develop programs over the years. We generally will bring a group of artists in. Um, they do a tour of SOFA. SOFA has a lecture series. We do uh, a workshop or a tour of some kind. Um, Chicago is a large city with five distinct gallery districts. So it's very easy to sort of do themed or, um, you know, very targeted um, sort of learning sessions by doing a tour around the city. And we usually have groups of up, you know, we've had groups as many as 25 people on a group. So uh, it can get, it can at times be like herding cats. Uh, but normally I would say we have 12 to 15 people on some of these missions. Uh, here's another overhead Im image of uh, SOFA. So they get upwards of 30 to 35,000 people. It's a public event, but it's, as you can see, it's gallery presented. It's not like um, a retail craft market um, and it's galleries. So you must be represented by a gallery or an institution. They do let nonprofits. So obviously, um, or government entities, we, you know, Craft Alliance had our own presentation at the event, so they do allow that, but there's, for the most part, there's generally no individual makers presenting. They have made a few exceptions in the last couple of years based on, um, they've often invited like individuals who've won major awards or significant awards um, to participate in the event. So it includes everything from small scale objects to large installation pieces. You see an installation in the foreground there. <clears throat> so here's one of our booths. So, we, so we've been doing, like I say, educational missions since 27, uh, 2007, uh, but in 2016, 2017 and 2018, we actually did our own gallery presentation. So we actually partnered with Studio 21 Fine Art, which is a contemporary art gallery based in Halifax. Um, so they were our consultant on the project. And then we hired in-market consultants in Chicago to actually man the booth and do transactions. Um, so we did it for three years. Um, it was very successful. Um, there were a decent number of sales uh, in the three years we did it. But what we're finding is that contemporary art fairs in general are incredibly, incredibly expensive to do. Um, so that really became our, our issue at that point is that um, it was costing so much money to actually produce uh, the event because we had to have a, we had a consultants, we had to have people in market. Uh, the booth itself, this is a double booth uh, that you're seeing right now. Um, the cost of that space uh, in Canadian dollars was around $40,000. Um, so these shelves are very expensive and everything, every plinth you see, every light hanging from the ceiling uh, costs extra money. So they're very, very expensive. Um, so we're kind of reevaluating that now. That's why we didn't go back in 2019. Uh, we did go and do uh, an educational mission in 2019. These are not our images. These are just other images from the show uh, that I wanted to show. This is an Indigenous gallery, uh, Blue Rain Gallery from New Mexico. Uh, and here are just a few images of work that we've represented at SOFA the three years that we were uh, doing the event. This is 2017. So a lot of ceramics. Um, Atlantic Canada doesn't have a lot of glass, so there was very little glass. Uh, in 2016, we had some fused glass, uh, but some hollowware, uh, ceramics, metal. Um, we The first year we did do some jewelry, but after that we stopped because about a third of the sofa exhibition is jewelry. And unless you have a booth full of jewelry, you're not going to sell any jewelry because... Um, people that want to buy jewelry, they want to see a lot of jewelry. Um, so there are some, you know, particular jewelry galleries that do um, very, very well. Uh, Noel Guillaumarche from Montreal does SOFA every year. And obviously, uh, Noel is one of our preeminent 
uh, art, jewelry, gallerists in Canada. And so he kind of uh, represents Canadian jewelry. So anybody with jewelry that's interested in SoFi, I'll automatically just send them to Noel. Um, yeah, so this is a representation of some of the work that we have shown while we were there. And then in 2019, uh, we did an educational mission and it just turned out that our educational mission were all jewelers that year. So that gave us a really interesting opportunity because we were able to really target jewelry, jewelry studios, jewelry galleries uh, within the greater Chicago area. And uh, that ended up being a really successful mission because uh, in 2018, just be, you know the year before this mission, um, a new organization was formed in Nova Scotia called Coadorn. So if there's any jewelers on the call today, uh, you may have heard of Coadorn. Oh, they were established in 2017, actually, I said 18. Um, so this came out of NASCAD University, a group of young emerging artists who had been recent graduates, all, along with some of their professors at NASCAD, really wanted to promote and develop the art jewelry uh, representation, exhibitions, um, curating of art jewelry. Um, so they created this organization. And the organization, though it's based in Nova Scotia, is open to anyone. There are, if you go look at their website, um, there are members from across Canada. Um, but you have to be interested in art jewelry. That's going to be their focus going forward. And last year, they were hoping to have an international touring exhibition. It was supposed to go to South Korea and Vancouver and some other locations. And unfortunately, um, they've moved it online. So they're doing online activity until such time that they can get going again. But you should go check out their website. It's very interesting. And they're doing some, um, they're doing some really innovative work. Um, just to backtrack a little bit about contemporary craft, you know, we started with SOFA back, I mentioned in 2007, and that experience of going to SOFA and meeting galleries resulted in learning from galleries that they could not identify what contemporary Canadian craft was. So, you know, there, you know, we have a few rock stars in Canada. Um, that people might know a name and realize that somebody is Canadian. But when we were talking about Eastern Canada, gallerists were telling us, I don't know what you're talking about. What is it? What does it look like? Show me something. Um, so we realized we needed to do something to sort of raise the profile um, and raise the level um, of people that are producing in our region. So we started doing a contemporary fine craft gallery exhibition which was in collaboration with our wholesale trade show, um, which, you know, they're diametrically opposed positions and markets. But what it did do is it allowed us to bring groups of people together all at the same time. So what we did was that we invited galleries from across North America. Every year we would invite six or eight galleries. Um, they would come and do workshops and presentations. We would have a small exhibition. Um, and then it was as we went forward and started doing more and more activity around Sofa Chicago, um, we were able to involve a lot of these people who had met the gallerists uh, when they were in Halifax uh, on previous occasions. So it actually really helped us launch more activity in contemporary fine craft. We actually stopped this program in 2018. We did for eight years. Um, because we moved venues and uh, we kind of lost our venue to to properly exhibit a gallery exhibition. So um, we were hoping to re redo that and present it in a different way in 2020, but that fell off due to COVID. So we're hoping maybe by 2022, we'll start back in, in that direction. Um, some other areas that we've explored besides wholesale and you know one of a kind contemporary craft is the design sector and um, it started out going to the art licensing trade shows in New York and that's held at the same time as the contemporary furniture show and this event called wanted design is something that popped up as a result of 
the Contemporary Furniture Show. And we realized by going to Want to Design that he was all emerging designers and makers. And a lot of them had been recent graduates of art colleges literally all around the world. There's representation from all over the globe at this event. So <clears throat> it involved a lot of craftspeople, um, a, lot of, a lot of designs and elements may have been experimental or new ideas, but it was a very intriguing event that's held um, in New York every May. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with the design sector in New York. Um, Wanted Design actually has a retail store in Brooklyn um, across the river from Manhattan. And what they do is every year in the month of May is, I call it design month in New York because there's um, Wanted Design, which goes the whole month of May. Um, there's the furniture show and then there's many other exhibitions and studio openings and so on that happen in the month of May. So if you're in, interested in sort of design-centered approaches to craft and making, then you absolutely have to go to New York in the month of May uh, because you're going, just gonna learn and see so much while you're there. Um, this is an exhibition of Canadian craft that was part of um, Wanted Design in uh, 2019. Um, a Canadian designer from New Brunswick, his name is uh, Jeff Ramsey. Um, Jeff studied at NASCAD University and went on to Toronto, I believe, to do uh, a master's. Um, and Jeff started out as a craftsperson, but he really wanted to do product design, product development. And um, so he's doing that. He is a freelance industrial designer based in St. John, New Brunswick. Um, those mugs that you see there are one of his designs. He's designed for major labels like Umbra uh, and some furniture companies as well. He won the uh, Toronto um, Interior Design Show, was doing uh, an emerging artist section called Out of the Box. Um, that usually happens in relation to their trade show in Toronto. He won the designer of the year back in, I think, 2016. And his work then automatically went to the furniture show uh, in New York. And then he was invited back in 2019 to curate a section of, um, of the exhibition based on design or crafted objects from where he lives. So these items were craftspeople that he selected from New Brunswick to participate. And at the same time, there were other uh, people from Canada that were selected to curate collections. And this is one from Fogo Island. And if anybody is, is not aware of Fogo Island, then you need to go Google Fogo Island. And Fogo Island was a fishing outport. It's an island, a group of islands off the coast of uh, Newfoundland. And, um, up until you know a few years ago, well, it's probably ten years ago now. Um, there was very few people living there, and um, um, a very very wealthy benefactor who was born on Fogo Island returned and decided to turn the island into a cultural destination. So, if you Google Fogo Island Inn, which is now an internationally recognized uh, eco tourism destination, um, with uh, its design has been published all over the world. Everything at the Fogo Island Inn on Fogo Island is handmade uh, by makers in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, some of the products have been designed by designers around the world, and then the design is taken to Newfoundland and executed there. But everything at the Fogo Island Inn is handmade. The furniture, the beds, the quilts, everything, the rugs on the floors, everything is handmade there. Um, so this was part of the New York exhibition as well. So Wanted Design also has exhibitions of contemporary art and craft and product design and development from around the world. I'm just gonna show you a few slides of innovative products and things that were happening there uh, when we were there. This is interesting how technology is evolving. This is a company that was making soap products uh, and you order them online and you can actually embed 
uh, words and phrases into the bars of soap. So you can see the computer in the upper uh, left corner there. So you could actually order this online and have a saying put in it. And it just shows up like a blank bar of soap. But as you use the soap, um, the words become evident uh, as, you're, as you're utilizing the soap uh, in the bath or shower. Um, so you're starting to see things like this, the uses of technology um, uh, in design. And that's one of the key elements of this wanted design exhibition um, is that it's really an ideas place. Um, this is an interesting uh, exhibition. This is a company from California called Doob. And it's basically a digital photo booth. Uh, it's about 12 feet in diameter. And you see the guy is standing at the door. So you actually go inside this round chamber. And you'll see there's a computer on the exterior. Uh, they shut the door. You strike a pose like the two people on your right. And they take a photograph of you. There are 62 high-speed cameras in the space. It takes your photo and then it prints a 3D replica. So these maquettes are all 3D printed pieces um, that are a result of the photography um, that's done in the space. So really fascinating elements uh, that you see at this event. Um, they also have uh, a design competition. So every year there'll be um, either a material or a concept that is put out uh, to designers and, um, and you have to come up with some solutions and you submit them. And then there, there's a, a jury, an international jury of designers that selects the winning pieces. This was uh, one of the, um, the jurors prizes um, from that year we were in New York. And this was an artist who came up with a process of um, creating felted concrete. And the intention ultimately here is, is could this become um, some kind of an, you know, an insulating uh, construction material going for it. And these are some samples um, that she created. So if you think of straw bale and other um, constructing processes, this is kind of uh, moving in that direction. So I mentioned the International Contemporary Furniture Fair. This is something that happens in May every year in New York. There are other furniture fairs around the US, but this is one of the larger ones. Uh, there tends to be a circuit of trade shows like this that people travel from place to place. Um, and there's lots of Canadian representation at this event. The interesting thing is, is that there's a lot of crossover. So it's a, it's a contemporary furniture show, but there's a lot of crossover between art craft, design, um, furniture, home decor, um, wall coverings, flooring, all those kinds of elements. Um, and over the, the time that I, like my first time I went was back in 2005. So over the years, you really see this evolution of how this is evolving. And we started out taking groups of cross people to the licensing show because we had people that wanted to learn about licensing. And what we were finding is that they were finding more interesting elements in the furniture and design end of things than they were in the licensing portion. Um, because they could see in the furniture show, they could see their designs uh, coming to life in a product because there were such um, interesting ranges of, of product that were being shown at this type of event. So you'll see lots of things, um, a lot of handcrafted items, some manufactured, um, a lot of mixed media pieces. This is furniture with wood and metal and wood and acrylic. Um, so it's a great place to sort of see an integration of many different things. This was a design presentation in 2019 um, from Germany. So there was a mixture of handmade and manufactured goods. Um, but they were all designed and produced in Germany. So a lot of these events often have featured exhibitions like this. These are a couple of chairs. The chair on the left is actually made from um, um, memory foam. So if you're familiar with memory foam mattresses, so memory foam is now starting to, you know, it was something that was created specifically for the bedding 
uh, in sleep industry, and now it's moving its way into furniture. So this was a chair that's completely made of memory foam. And the ones on the uh, right are um, made from the same material as lobster cages. <clears throat> uh, this is Martha Sturdy, a well-known Canadian designer uh, who's been around for many, many years. So she had a large presence at this event um, with a lot of stone and metal objects, um, very interior focused. And then other things with mid-century design and influences, cork and bamboo uh, were big materials that were being used at the event. But it's just interesting to see how people are using uh, some of these materials and incorporating them uh, into new products and designs. So I'm gonna go through some of these quite quickly because um, I actually have a lot of them. So, the, oh, this is a, a lighting company um, and, and the dish on the pedestal. Um, these lighting pieces are laser cut steel. So it starts with a, um, a large sheet of steel and it's, you know, it's des obviously designed in AutoCAD and then the machine laser cuts it. And then they take the piece of cut steel out and fold it into, it's almost like origami, folding it into um, the light shade format. And the, I wasn't actually, I wanted to take a picture of, they actually had the machine there that laser cuts um, the pieces of steel, but they actually would not let me take a photo of it. Um, here's some other brightly colored outdoor furniture. These are all reproductions of sort of old traditional styles, but they're actually cast resin pieces. And it goes all the way to very traditional. This is Thomas Mosier, which is a well-known um, New England furniture maker doing all handcrafted furniture. Uh, this is Mole. Mole is a Canadian Vancouver-based company. Some of you may be familiar with their booth displays. Some of you may own a booth display from Molo Design. Um, but they do more than just uh, movable spaces. So this whole you know, 12 or 14 foot booth display uh, is all made of paper. And you actually were the, on the, the right hand picture where the woman is walking out. These are actually walls and you actually enter into their booth space. Their booth was about uh, 30 or 40 feet square. It was massive structure in the middle of the space, but they were doing, if you go inside and look, they were doing some pretty innovative things. These are all Canadian companies uh, that we met at this event. So lots of furniture and accessory type companies that are, are trying to enter the US market. Here's a felted sofa. Um, and that, and interesting, that's uh, from 2019. And um, I'm gonna show you in a minute some colors for 2021. And, and that's one of the prime colors for this year. The other interesting element, um, I mentioned that a lot of our craftspeople were finding more connections to what was happening at the furniture show and the design uh, elements um, to the extent that back in around 2016, they started implementing and having a contemporary art section uh, to the furniture fair. So that was very interesting because you start getting these um, partnerships and collaborations between um, makers and manufacturers. Um, we had uh, back at probably, I guess it was probably 2015 or 16, we had uh, a woman from Nova Scotia who actually is certified to design tartans. So she actually designs and ex executes woven tartans and they're all copywritten and registered with the Royal Society of Tartans in Scotland. And um, she actually ended up finding a partnership uh, with a sofa manufacturer that was looking for something very exclusive um, to put on their products. So she actually custom designed a tartan that they could then exclusively use um, for their own products. So back in 2017, 2018, we started looking at the UK market. Um, the, um, the UK and the European Union 
we're negotiating a free trade agreement with Canada. Um, unfortunately, we weren't expecting Brexit at the time, uh, but Brexit has come and happened and uh, there is another trade agreement with the UK uh, temporarily in place until one is negotiated. In any case, uh, with free trade, we were looking at the UK and the European market um, as being an opportunity, especially if there's a lot of restrictions that are removed uh, on entering into the country. So um, in 2019, we led an educational mission to collect, which is the SOFA of the UK. Um, and it's run by the Craft Council UK. And it was in 2019 for 10 years, uh, it was presented at Saatchi Gallery in London, uh, which is a very well-known uh, gallery space. And um, so we took a group of uh, administrators. It was mostly craft councils, craft organizations, single media organizations uh, that went with us to collect. And it was really an exploratory mission to see, you know, what's the range of work, what's the quality, um, what is the potential of, of moving into that market? So these are just a few images from Collect in 2019. Um, a lot of foreign interest. There were exhibitions from Korea, um, Australia, America. There were none from Canada, um, which is something we would like to remedy all over Europe. Um, but it's very interesting. It's a different type and scale of event. Um, sterling silver and hollow ware is big in the UK market. You rarely ever see it at exhibitions in North America. This is a piece by a uh, father and son duo from uh, the Netherlands, I believe, or Belgium. Um, this is fine silver, 999 fine silver. And if you look at the detailed photo, it's studded with 300 tubes and every tube has a diamond in it. Uh, there was no price on this. Uh, you could ask, I guess, but I think people were afraid to ask. This piece was actually um, done for uh, an exhibition, I believe in 2017 or 2018, that was in Shanghai, China, uh, which they were asked to produce um, something specific for that event. Uh, and this is uh, Collect as well. And interestingly enough, Collect, uh, and it's kind of a goal of the Craft Council of UK, is they don't want actually that much jewelry um, in their event because they were finding events were getting overrun with jewelry and kind of eclipsing um, other contemporary work. So they've put a limit on how much jewelry. We saw that Sofa Chicago has, like I said, about 30% of the event. Uh, is jewelry and you need quantities of jewelry in order to sell there. So Craft Council UK is kind of limited the presentation of jewelry. And the other reason for that is that the UK has a huge jewelry market. Um, you have the Goldsmiths Fair, you have the Goldsmith Center, you have several uh, silversmithing and other metalsmithing organizations. So there already are multiple events throughout the year that just feature um, jewelry, contemporary jewelry or art jewelry. Um, so they felt that that market was already being served uh, in the UK. We went back again in 2020. We just got out of London before about a week before lockdown, uh, which was a good thing. Uh, and in 2020, they moved Collect to a new venue. The new venue is, um, uh, Somerset House, which is on the Thames River near Waterloo Bridge. And it's a very different building. Such a gallery was large, open, sort of expansive gallery spaces, whereas Somerset House is a public building. And basically every gallery took a room space within the building. The other interesting element we discovered about Collect was that the scale of the work was very, very different than at SOFA. SOFA was, and, and the American shows are all about big and bigger and how big can you make it? Um, whereas we found Collect to be more object fo focused and smaller items. Um, and I think that really speaks to how people live in the UK. Um, you know, property is very expensive. Um, 
people live in smaller square footages. Um, so I think it stands to reason that um, that the market there would be for smaller objects. So you can see just the aesthetic of the space is very different from what you saw in the images from Sofa. Uh, Goldsmiths Fair is a large group. They're part of the Goldsmiths Company. Um, the UK, if people are not familiar with, a, with the traditions of craft and applied arts in the United Kingdom is, you know, seven, 800 years ago, um, there were all these basically trade unions is what they were. Now they refer to them as guilds. Um, but at the, at the time they were trade unions. So if you needed metal smithing done or wrought iron work done or, or whatever the case may be, if you needed saddles for your horses, then you went to a leather smith or you went to a blacksmith or a goldsmith. Um, and these trade union groups still exist today. One of the, the wealthiest in the country is the goldsmiths company and they produce the goldsmiths fair, which is a jewelry and hollowware show uh, that happens several times a year in the UK. They also run the Goldsmith Center and the Goldsmiths Company. So in the UK, uh, if you are uh, a goldsmith or metalsmith and you are hallmarking, you are required in the UK to hallmark all your jewelry, uh, then you have to register and every single piece that you produce is registered uh, with the Goldsmith Company. Um, so needless to say, they're a very, very wealthy organization. Uh, here's a few more pictures from uh, Collect last year. So the other area that we work in is, um, you know, in, in terms of wholesale and, and even one of a kind to a certain extent, um, as part of our educational component, we've done some uh, best practices missions. So a best practices mission is different slightly from a trade mission in that your focus is more educational and providing direct opportunities. So in 2018 and 2019, we did two um, cultural product development missions uh, in New England. Um, and we worked with a group of museums uh, in New England. And <clears throat> every museum has a gift shop. So they're buying wholesale but then also many museums are buying for their permanent collections, or they may be buying a one of a kind work for to be complementary to something they're doing. Uh, the Museum of Modern Art in Boston has three gift shops. They all have a completely different focus and they do have some very high end one of a kind work in their shops. So we actually went and did a three or four day tour uh, we would have workshops directly with the buyers, the museum buyers, talking about product development, what they're looking for, what they're buying. Um, many museums um, also develop and design their own products. So if they own a permanent collection, they will often create reproduction work based on what's in their permanent collection. So that was part of the product development process is looking at you know, what is within the permanent collections of some of the museums that we interact with to see if there's any opportunities for craftspeople in Atlanta, Canada to feed into that process and um, start creating very specific uh, design products that would suit um, the retail environment of those museums. And that's also what led us to um, get involved with the Museum Retail Shops Association in the US. There are thousands of museum gift shops uh, in the US, fewer in Canada, but it's still an important market in Canada as well. So we do engage with uh, Canadian buyers. These are some images from uh, one of our uh, museum trips uh, where we had interactions with both retail and buyers in a workshop setting, uh, talking about their process and what they do. We've also done um, other types of educational missions. This is one we did to, um, oh, that has NS on it. it should be a, a typo, NC for North Carolina. Um, Atlantic Canada is, is obviously um, a, a major tourism destination in North America. And so 
craft and tourism is very, very important. Tourism statistics in Atlantic Canada show that you know, a large percentage of people who visit Atlantic Canada leave with something that's handmade in Atlantic Canada. Um, so cultural tourism, experiential tourism um, has always been sort of in our mindset in what we do. So we've done several. We did, um, this was a craft experiential uh, tourism um, mission that we did to North Carolina. And we also have done several in New England as well. Um, this one was interesting in that we were looking at how are craftspeople in their studios engaging with the public. And this, this was uh, a community, if there's any potters uh, on the call today, if you're familiar with Seagrove, North Carolina. Seagrove is a small community of about 800 people. It's sort of in south central North Carolina. Uh, kind of out in the middle of the woods, but it's a village of 800 people. And in the village of Seagrove, there are 100 potters. So one of every eight people in the town is a potter. Uh, and because it's so far south, most of the firing is done outdoors. They do a lot of wood firing, soda firing, um, raku, smoke firing, sagar firing, uh, and other processes. So what they've done is they've, the reason we went to this village of Seagrove is that they've actually created pottery events that have become huge cultural tourism events. So they do weekends that are called kiln openings. So this particular potter was Ben Owen III. He's a third generation potter from Seagrove. He has a large uh, outdoor wood fired kiln. So he would fire that and the weekend that they do an opening, everybody would schedule to have their, their kilns opened on the same weekend after a major firing. And this be, becomes a massive event. Uh, ben Owen is known in North Carolina as somebody who does very rich red pottery. And unfortunately, I don't have a color because the time we visited, uh, he actually didn't have any red pottery. Um, but he literally will get a lineup of people outside his studio when he's opening a kiln. Uh, and sell every single piece that comes out of the kiln. So, um, so that's why we were there, sort of exploring, you know, what the opportunities are and how do we translate that um, as a cultural experience um, back in Atlanta, Canada. Um, so, some other th I'd like to just touch on some trends we're watching and things we're seeing at trade shows. Um, so th things like 3D printing is obviously in print on demand has become massive over the last few years. Uh, laser cutting technology and other technologies like AutoCAD and um, using the technologies as a component of what you're producing. Um, if you go online, we have a, a young emerging uh, potter in Halifax. His name is Julian Covey, C-O-V-E-Y. Go look Julian up. Um, Julian graduated from NASCAR a couple of years ago, and um, Julian is 3D printing. So he's designing his pottery pieces um, on computer. He 3D prints, and then he makes a mold, and then he's slip casting, uh, and then he's using an airbrush technique for his glazing. So he's coming up with this really unusual product that doesn't look like traditional pottery. Um, and because of the value he's added and the processes, he's actually, for emerging artists, he's actually getting some very good pricing on his product. So there's lots of innovative things like that that we're seeing in the market. Uh, reuse, repurpose, and reposition. So the whole, you know, eco-friendly upcycling, uh, repurposing world has really, you know, we, we've been seeing that for five or six years now, but I would say the last 18 months, it's, it's really started to explode. And we're now even, you know, we were talking about people, you know, creating eco-friendly packaging. And now the trend is zero waste. You know, why do you need packaging? Um, what's the purpose behind this? So you're really seeing a shift happening in, in that front. Um, ethical and value-based products. So, you know, consumers are now looking to 
What's your purpose? What's your authenticity? What's your story? And that's becoming a really critical point. And I think for craftspeople uh, in, in being able to tell the story of what you're doing and how you got to be where you are, I, I think that is going to lend itself to that story of authenticity that you need to consider. Um, new age, so body, mind, and spirit. Holistic wellness, spirituality. You know, we really saw in 2020 with the COVID lockdown, you know, the phrase, the phrase of 2020 that I remember most is self-care that everyone was using. It was all about, you know, um, mental health and um, living your best life and all of these uh, phrases that have sort of entered the vernacular over the past year. Uh, it was interesting this past week when I was looking at some of the trend forecasting website, germ-free and non-porous were words that were coming up frequently, especially in terms of interior design and home decor, is people gravitating towards solid surfaces like stone and other materials that would, you know, hopefully be easier to clean and cut down on the potential of, um, you know, crossover of germs uh, in your home. Um, chess was a big thing. I don't know if anybody saw or watched the Queen's Gamut, but as soon as that show clicked on streaming services, uh, literally people were selling out of chess sets. Um, that's not necessarily something that may affect cross people directly, unless you're into making chess sets, I guess. Um, but it really shows you what's happening in terms of social media and new content that's online and how it's influencing what happens in the marketplace. Uh, Multi-purpose spaces have become really important. So backyards, home offices, how are you using the space and utilizing space uh, either within your home um, or spaces that you uh, tend to, to work in or gravitate towards. You know, over the last 10 years, there was a really move towards open concept office space as well. You know, most of those open concepts office spaces are not going to exist and they probably don't even exist now. They've probably already disappeared. Um, so that's interesting in that that has sort of changed the office dynamic. And then we're going to see obviously in 2021, whether people um, really return to their offices uh, in downtown locations on a permanent basis. Uh, traditional uh, and contemporary, um, or sorry, the word is transitional. Um, so that is the evolution of contemporary and traditional designs sort of in a modern setting. Um, we're seeing that more and more with, with uh, mid-century modern furniture coming back and a lot of that has to do with recycling and upcycling. Um, I, I don't know about the prairies right now, but every major city and town in Atlanta, Canada has somebody that's repurposing mid-century furniture. And because it was higher quality solid wood furniture at the time, um, it's endured. And so there's a real resurgence in what's happening with that. Um, the phrase Japandi came up several times when I was looking at trend forecasting. And that is this, this fusion between Japanese sensibility and design and Scandinavian design, which would lend itself to the mid-century modern that came out of Denmark, for example. So that those are things that are, are happening in the market. Um, collections, seasonal or thematic-based um, ideas. We sort of talked about that in developing product for wholesale uh, in our session yesterday. Any kind of customization uh, made to order, commissioned. We're seeing people starting to use the word bespoke more frequently. Uh, and that really just sort of speaks to people wanting things uh, in a customized fashion. So we're seeing that with retail, wholesale. We're even seeing that with, um, we've seen a few jewelers in our region. Uh, over the past year, really jump on to getting more commissioned work, being present on social media, and sort of being actively pursuing uh, doing made-to-order um, work for customers. And that, you know, whether that was an influence of COVID 
and people wanting to support local more. Um, but it's something that's that's been coming to the forefront in the last year or two. Um, some other areas I mentioned mid-century design, boho, so that's sort of this um, bohemian uh, resurgence products and designs from the 1970s like macrame, hanging chairs, plants, uh, edible gardens. Uh, everyone sort of was a homebody in 2020 and cooking at home and doing more things at home. Judaica is still um, uh, an important category. Um, you don't see it promoted and, and, um, and utilized as much in Canada. I do know there's a market for it. There are several artists in Ontario that I know that um, are of Jewish descent and do um, Judaica items. It's very popular in the US market. There are actually several Judaic organizations that host events. Um, art fair style events. Mom and baby uh, is very popular right now. And I'm suspecting in the next couple of months, there's probably going to be a little COVID booby uh, a baby boom <laughs> happen. I know in, in my, personally in my family, I have got two coming in the next couple of months. So um, my, my nephews were busy during COVID. Um, so that's become a really big category. So not only just mom and baby, but care products. So baby creams, baby oils, uh, lotions, um, and items for mother as well, but also baby accessories, baby clothing, um, that sort of thing. Uh, other products uh, in categories, indigenous, Celtic, I mentioned. Steampunk is oddly um, still a thing. Uh, I thought it would have died a couple of years ago, but we actually have several people in Atlantic Canada that are doing very well with that thematic style of work. Um, BIPOC and LGBT are going to be big. Um, well, they're already big this year and into the next couple of years. Jewelry and accessories are now considered mainstream products. So um, jewelry can pretty well exist in many different formats in many different types of retail environments. Whereas five or 10 years ago, you had to go to a specific type or style of store um, to get the type of jewelry you were looking for. So that has sort of been deemed a mainstream product now. Um, glass, ceramics, jewelry continue to be major market segments. Um, use of color has become really important. In product, I mentioned in our session yesterday about jewelry, you know, if it's basic sterling silver, you know, pretty well every shop that's selling jewelry already sells silver jewelry. So, you know, what's the value added component that is going to want them um, to sell your jewelry? So glass, lucite, resins, enamels. Um, enamel has really jumped on the market the last year or two, has become very, very popular. Things like verses, quotes, affirmations, Anything that's inspirational uh, and goes back to that whole concept of holistic wellness and spirituality um, sort of feeds into that component as well. And we've had people go to the New York trade show uh, with theme-based products that have actually done very, very well in that market. Some retail themes that we're seeing popping up, I, I'm sure people have heard of influ uh, influencer marketing. So influencers on social media, you know, that all started on Instagram with people taking selfies and posing with a product, but that's, that's going to enter a new phase. That sort of process is, is dying. Um, brands now are looking at authenticity and the experiential element of whatever their product is. So if it's, if it's Nike, they're going to be showing basketball courts or people on the street wearing their product. Um, and it's gonna transfer into, um, I'm seeing it a lot on Instagram and YouTube right now where people are on their platforms doing whatever they do and they're interspersing and getting paid to do brand awareness as part of the process. And it's usually exper experiential. So, you know, somebody's in their kitchen, 
uh, cooking a meal and they're talking on YouTube about something completely different. And oh, by the way, they just happen to use the latest gadget from OXO Good Grips, you know, or they're using the latest version of the KitchenAid mixer. Um, so that element is starting to creep its way in and that whole sort of selfie influencer thing is starting to disappear. Um, online social commerce. So um, the trend forecasters are saying that online selling is really going to move into um, individual smart devices. So you're seeing a bit of it now where you can order things online from your phone or your iPad. But getting sort of away from that computer or laptop format uh, in other parts of the world. You know, I was in I was in Japan and China two years ago. And, you know, they're already six, eight, 10 years ahead of us in some of their processes and technologies. And a lot of the social commerce elements have to do with payment processes that <clears throat> North America, the banks and the processing systems have really not developed uh, to the point where um, they're easily um, sort of added on to the shopping cart process. So that they're really predicting that in 2021, that is really going to explode. And that is often as a result of what happened in 2020. Everybody had to sort of figure a way to do contact, you know, contactless uh, transactions. So um, that has, I think that's really moved that whole situation forward. Um, when I was in China two years ago, um, we had this young interpreter who actually went to university at University of British Columbia to do a commerce degree. And he was uh, back in China doing, um, doing international trade. And uh, this young person, 30 years old, does not carry a wallet. It doesn't exist. Everything exists on his telephone. Uh, so you tap everywhere you go. Um, so that's, I think, you know, that's all coming. Augmented reality and artificial intelligence are now going to play a role. And I think that's going to lead into the whole smartphone device element. You're starting now to see uh, QR codes starting to pop up because now phones can easily read QR codes. You don't need an app to read a QR code. Um, oh, this, I just wanted to show some mid-century modern. Um, this is a 1960 mid-century sofa by Hans Wagner from Denmark. Um, I was going through my libraries of, of photos the other day and I, I just wanted to show this. This was actually in a gallery in Japan, in Tokyo, two years ago. And this sofa was selling in Japan for 800,000 yen which is nine to 10,000 Canadian dollars. So obviously that designer and that sofa has appreciated immensely over the 60 years. Uh, but it, it was, that sofa was in original condition. These are a few other examples of mid-century modern um, that are hitting the market. Pantone, I mentioned that bright yellow sofa at the International Furniture Show. These are the two official colors of Pantone for 2021. And the illuminating, which is the bright yellow, um, is, supposed, is supposed to mean optimism um, for the year ahead, that things are going to get better. Um, and this comes, if, you, if you're into color forecasting and trending, you can go and look at the, pan, the Pantone forecast. These are the, the main two colors that they're talking about, but there's obviously shades of gray and other colors, and then they also have complementary colors that mix in with that, that process. I realize I've gone way over time, but there's only a short uh, portion left, so uh, please stick with me. Um, I said that I would talk about art licensing, and this is the, the final section that I'm going to cover. Um, I mentioned we got into the art licensing world back in 2005, and actually the reason we got into art licensing is because we were finding that there were craftspeople, um, especially um, emerging artists that were coming out of art college and they had studied surface design and they were very interested in where could I take this as a concept. Um, so we started investigating that. We actually did some workshops on art licensing uh, in Nova Scotia and then we did our first 
educational mission, uh, probably in 2007, um, to the New York Art Licensing Trade Show, just to sort of learn about it. And the interesting thing at the time, the Art Licensing Trade Show would hold a week-long, five-day educational conference associated with their trade show. So you could actually go for a whole week and, you know, from the start to finish, you would literally learn everything there is to learn about the licensing world. Um, they've changed that structure. A lot of the educational elements in licensing have moved online uh, in the last three years. So that has changed a bit. Um, the interesting element of licensing that we've learned over a period of time is that the person doing it, if you wanna do it yourself, and represent yourself, you have to be very technology savvy. You need to have the latest software, you need Photoshop, you need Illustrator, um, you need to be able to digitally manipulate files because everything in the licensing world is digital. So you may have started out with an original painting, original piece of artwork or craft, um, but ultimately it gets digitized and then it gets transferred um, onto a product. So the licensing world, you can do it yourself or you can hire an agent. There are licensing agents out there um, who would represent you, but they cost a lot of money. Basically they take 50% of everything you make if they're going to represent you and do the work for you. So to just give you uh, a, a sense of it, licensing is a massive sector. Basically any product in the public domain that has a design on it, it started somewhere with an artist or a designer or an illustrator or a graphic artist. Um, and our interest obviously came in because of surface design and patterning. So the licensing sector right now is about a $280 billion sector. It's massive. And North America, Canada and the US are the biggest uh, markets for licensed products in the world. Um, Disney, and I, you guys have a great Disney success story here in Saskatchewan with one of your artists recently uh, uh, getting licensing uh, ability to produce uh, Disney characters. Um, but they are the largest owner of, of licensed product on the planet. And they own many, many different uh, brands, ABC, ESPN, Pixar, Walt Disney Studios. There's many, many, many. There's many more than that. There are just a few. There are some other key brands in the marketplace that are also into licensing. So basically, you're taking um, your design or concept, you're digitizing it, and basically, you're selling um, that image to a manufacturer. And generally, it's a one time use. So you're giving them license. So it's art licensing you're giving them license to and permission to use that image generally for a one-time use. Uh, you're not selling your copyright. You're just giving them permission to use that image for whatever that purpose you agree on. Um, and then they will go ahead and use it. So licensing can happen in many different ways and formats. It can be just a one-time use we wanna use a picture of your pottery in a magazine, or we wanna use it on the cover of a book, uh, something of that nature. And that would be a one-time use and most likely you would just be paid a fee. Um, in Canada, we have Carfac, which is Canadian Artist Representation and Carfac does produce licensing guidelines. Uh, and those are guidelines. And obviously we're talking about the US market here. Um, so it may be different. And then it also depends on the reputation and, and what it is that the maker or creator of that artwork, uh, what their reputation is. And you know, if you have standard pricing, then it's all a negotiation from then on. Um, in some instances, if you're working with a manufacturer who's going to produce a series of items, maybe you've come up with a character, you know, not unlike Mickey Mouse. You, you don't want to infringe on Mickey Mouse, but you, that Mickey Mouse is, is, is called character art. So um, if you've developed a character of your own and you find a manufacturer, so in that case, they may license the right to use the images to create 
some other product, and then there may be a royalty involved in that process as well. So it really depends on what it is and how it works. But this list I've included, I'm not going to go through it, but you can just see that by reading through it, it can have many, many, many different interpretations. If you're a fine art painter, it can be just fine art publishing and reproduction. So, you know, have you ever been to Winners or or Home Sense, any of those stores that sell um, those reproduction canvases? Um, those are all, they're all fine art reproductions is what they are. Somebody has manufactured those. They have hopefully have a licensing agreement with all the artists. There is some copyright theft and image theft that happens around the world. And you have to be aware of that and sort of go in with your eyes open if you're going to approach this market. So there's many, many different applications for this process. I'm just going to show you a couple of quick samples. This is a, a designer from Nova Scotia. Her name is Susan Black. Look her up on Instagram. She's, she's always posting stuff on Instagram. Her style is very much collage. And then um, she puts wording. Um, I, I think she's sort of getting to the point where she's got so many designs that what happens is if you're going to work in licensing as an artist, what will happen over a period of time is that you'll collect a database of digital imagery that you then can start manipulating the digital entities and not have to create a brand new piece of art every time you do it. So that can be very interesting in that you can repurpose something and resell it and it's not the same image. Um, Susan has done a lot in the paper industry, greeting cards. She's had multiple collections in the United Kingdom uh, with several different greeting card manufacturers where she's done, you know, series or like she'll do 12 designs for a greeting card company and they will repeat that over a period of time, that sort of thing. This is a photographer also from Nova Scotia. Her name is Connie. And Connie does high speed macro photography. Um, she also does uh, what's called rain droplet photography. So you can superimpose an image in a droplet of water. Um, this piece was uh, you know, a macro piece. So Connie came to one of our early, probably back around 2010, came to one of our early art licensing uh, missions in New York. She learned about the industry. She decided, you know, photography, everybody was saying photography is really hard to license. And the reason is that everybody owns a camera nowadays because everybody's got a smartphone. And there are so many stock photography websites. You have Getty Images, you have um, Shutter. There's a whole bunch of different stock photography where you can go use an image for one time and pay $3 for it or something. Um, and she didn't want that. She wanted her photography to be somewhere else, either with fine art reproductions or you print on demand or in some other uh, element of the market. Um, so after the attending Surtex, she actually went searching for an agent. She found herself an agent who was based in Florida and he actually specialized in fine art photography. And so she said, well, let's go for it. And, um, and this is an interesting story in that it tells you, first of all, you never know where you're gonna get a lead and you never know where you're gonna find new business. And so she went in this, you know, intending that, yeah, maybe I'll get my, you know, some of my botanical photography will end up in a book or maybe it'll be on a greeting card or whatever the case may be. Um, and what happened was her agent actually put some of her photography on a website in Germany that did print on demand and it was all floral items and you could basically get pick an image and get it printed on a product type idea. So it was a print on demand website. But what happened was there was a designer who was actually based in Florida. It was kind of odd um, considering the agent was in Florida. Uh, but there was actually an architect in Florida who was looking for large scale image like you see on the screen right now. And um, 
he was actually looking at websites around the world and he he landed on this art website in Germany and he saw some of her images and he went, oh my gosh, that's what I'm looking for. He Googled her, found out she was in Nova Scotia and he literally picked up the phone and called her and said, you know, I just discovered your product online. What can you do? And, you know, he said what he was looking for. And so he said, I want something big, colorful. I want it macro. I want it up close and detail. And um, she said, fine, I'll send you some images. So she sent him some proofs, five or six proofs. He picked this image. He was designing the lobby of a large commercial building in Florida. And this is actually a six foot by eight foot light box. So it's two inches thick. And the image you see there is printed on a piece of translucent mylar. And the lighting is be it's backlit with LED lighting. Um, so she received a one-time licensing agreement. He used this. There was only one produced. I think she received around $1,200 Canadian um, for the use of that image. That architect has since come back to her multiple times. And he designs hotels and commercial buildings all over the United States. And he's used just some of her basic photography and her water drop photography on multiple occasions. So it's ended up that she's now selling a lot of work into the commercial design and commercial interiors sector. And they have their own trade shows. And this particular light box um, is a company based in West Virginia. And the West Virginia company that does these LED light boxes are really well known, I guess, in the shopping mall industry for doing, you know, floor, you know, when you walk into the mall and you see a floor plan, well, that's an LED light box. So that's mainly what this company does. And it, this was the first time somebody ever commissioned a light box from this company with something other than a floor plan or a wayfinding pattern on it. And I guess the day this picture was taken, the day it was shipped to, from West Virginia to Florida. And um, I guess the owner of the company walked through and said, uh, okay, what the heck is that? Uh, that's not the normal thing he see, sees on his, his production floor. And he was taken with it. He was absolutely like, oh my gosh, we got to investigate this. And so he called her and he, he licensed several images to design a booth for a trade show in Las Vegas. So, you know, that whole circle comes around again. You just never know what market you could end up in in that process. I have one more story to tell you, and this is uh, two young women from Nova Scotia. They are actually sisters-in-law. So these two young women married a couple of brothers. Um, one of the sisters um, uh, on the left here is Caverly, and Caverly uh, studied fine art, and she's a painter. And uh, her sister-in-law, uh, Julia, studied Ill illustration at Sheraton College. And um, they were all kind of individually doing their own things. And Caverly asked her sister-in-law one day, do you know anything about licensing? Because I'm doing some design, um, some painting that I think could be really interesting if, if I was able to get it licensed somehow. And Julia said, Yes, of course I know about licensing because I studied it in at Sheraton. And uh, so they got together and eventually they discovered Craft Alliance and they came on one of our missions to uh, New York to the licensing trade show. And they just went out there and found the market. So these fabrics you're seeing were all original paintings by Caverly. And then Julia took them and digitized them put them into repeat pattern format and they sold them to RJR is a major California manufacturer of fabrics. Um, they have a, a, a manufacturing facility in California and their products have now become so popular um, that RJR now features them as they actually refer to their designs on their website um, as Briar Hill and all the patterns and designs that they've come up with now have names to them. The other thing that 
the one sister Julia was doing is she started a quilting business. And now there, she, she designs quilt patterns. Um, she does quilt kits. And she also produces a line of finished, ready to go uh, quilts that you can buy. So now they're creating quilt kits from the fabrics, their own design custom fabrics that RJR is producing for them. Uh, and now RJR is selling their um, quilt quarters and kits on RJR's website. Um, and now they're getting representation from other major Hoffman and um, Trentex, which are major uh, re fabric retailers um, who are now taken on their product line as part of it. So this is a really interesting story. This is their own personal uh, Etsy page where they are marketing everything that they do. So they're marketing the fabrics, they're marketing their swatches and quilt kits. Um, so you can search their patterns and you can buy samples and swatches. And they're also finish, uh, selling finished quilts. And if you look at the left side there, they're also send, selling digital patterns of all their quilts. So you can actually pay to buy one of their patterns. And then you can also purchase the fabrics to reproduce it the way that they've uh, done the design. So the interesting thing from a licensing point of view here is they created the art. They've got a licensing deal. So they're getting paid for the fabric. And then they're bringing the fabric back and using it for the quilting purposes and then reselling it again. So they've got many streams of revenue that are coming in from this process. So it's, it's a very fascinating thing. We call licensing uh, making money while you sleep uh, because you know it takes a bit of effort. It, if somebody seriously wants to get into this, it's at least three, four, five years of work to sort of get to the stage that these two women are at at the moment. And, uh, but it can be done. You know, it, the opportunities are out there and, and you can make it work for sure. That's it for trends and opportunities. Um, we are launching a major event this coming Wednesday, if anybody would like to attend. I think Greg, if you have the link, you're gonna put it in the chat. Yeah, I'll um, drop it right there. And is it the link to our website or the link to the registration you're putting? Uh, the link to that has our website, um, or I mean the description of it on our website also has the registration link right. on okay. that page. So you can read about the details of what it is and then register an account for it and then also register for the launch event this week. Right. So we have partnered with Ryerson University in Toronto. Ryerson in the last couple of years have launched what is called Magnet Export Portal. So basically it's an online community network uh, for exporters or people that are, you don't have to be a current exporter. It's, it's about networking and exchange of information. So Craft Alliance in partnership with Ryerson, we have created what we're calling Craft X, X is for exports, the Craft X community on the Magnet Portal. So we are going to have our own landing page and our own library of wholesale and export content that you can log in and download for free. So there's no cost to participate in the portal. Um, we're doing, the portal is live, not right now. If you wanna go in and sign up and join us and learn about exporting and all the resource materials that we've developed, uh, you can do that. You can also attend on Wednesday where, Wednesday is our official launch day of the event. Uh, it's taken us several months to get the platform and the community built. Um, and we're, we're onboarding all our resource materials uh, as we speak. So that's an exciting event for us because we've been asked many times to share a lot of the information. And because we're Atlantic based and we receive funding within Atlantic Canada, it's difficult for us to take people on our online portal from outside Atlanta, Canada. So this magnet portal is going to help us sort of reach a broader audience of makers across Canada. Okay, well, I, um, that was quite the presentation and oh, quite- Oh, this, this is, I had, to, I had to put this in, sorry, Carmen. Go, 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 is, go ahead. 
this this is a yarn bombing from Manhattan that I had to take a picture of one day. That's my end. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I just wanted to to bring people's attention to one thing around licensing. Uh, across the street from the Craft Council's uh, building is a, a, sh a shoe store kind of place called Icon Shoes. They're actually a licensing place. They've got a big facility in Saskatoon, which they they purchased from California and moved it to Saskatoon. And they do a lot of licensing. So if you're interested, it might be worth looking them up. I don't know if they can help you at the shoe store directly, but trying to find out. And maybe maybe we can find out some more information on them as well. Um, the, other, the other thing I wanted to tell people about was that uh, we have a couple of programs coming up in our professional practices programming. So starting in mid-April or towards the end of April is a five-week grant writing program led by Michael Peterson and Laura Helgert. And then starting in May is a five-week uh, program on marketing uh, for a new product launch. So I encourage you to sign up for those programs. Um, they're going to be, um, you know, they you'll actually get your work done through the program, which is a great way of, of taking these seminars. There's also uh, through Creative Saskatchewan and Women Entrepreneurs, um, a basic business plan writing program. And I think that's on Wednesday of this week. So there's still time to sign up for that. And, and that was uh, actually Tuesday, Carly. Oh, Tuesday, sorry. Tuesday. Thanks, but there's still time. Yeah. But yes, so open entrepreneurs, but it's open to everyone. Right. And it's at no cost to all these things are at no cost to you. So take advantage of the generosity of our, of our funders at this time uh, to to take advantage of these programs. And there was one other thing. Oh, our for Saskatchewan residents, Dimensions is happening this month. So again, this is a, an opportunity for you to register uh, or to submit up to two pieces uh, to be adjudicated and juried for an exhibition that's going to tour. And it's actually got two stops in, uh, in the Atlantic region, one at St. John, New Brunswick, and the other at St. John's, Newfoundland. And so uh, it's a competition. There are prizes, prize money. Go to our website for details, but know that April 6th, I believe, is the entry day for that. So there's lots of things happening. Um, this presentation, Bernie, has made me, you know, I've had so much go through my mind about how, how it is we go about our work and, you know, how what steps we need to take in order to bring a lot of these opportunities to our, our members. And uh, uh, this is an important first step. So thanks so much for your contribution to this. It uh, really, really was helpful. And the right. world is really our oyster, isn't it? it? You know what? It really is. And I was, the other day I was going through slides and I, you know, we have a library of thousands and thousands of images and it's a matter of taking that, the time to edit them and put them into sort of uh, unique little libraries that people can go and investigate on their own. But there's, you know, there's so many things that you see when you're traveling. Um, you know, I mentioned that I had been to Japan uh, two years ago and that was a, I was on a cultural trade mission with actually the Minister of Culture. And um, we went to Japan, China, the UK and, you're meeting with international craft organizations and galleries and museums and individual makers. And the things you see and learn is just phenomenal. And it's all out there for people to take advantage of. It's just a matter of making the decision that you want to go there, you know? Yeah. It's, it's great. All right. So are there any questions, uh, Greg? We had a question come in uh, just asking about a specific product. Somebody wanted to know if there was, uh, if we saw much for beeswax candles at these shows at New York and Toronto. You know what? And... I, actually, you know what? That was a note I made this morning that in the past year, candles have really jumped into the market again um, and all kinds of shapes, sizes, and forms. 
The one thing that's happened with beeswax is beeswax covers for food. Um, bees. Oh yeah, the wax, beeswax wraps. wraps. Those the are wraps. Huge. Yeah, that's exploded crazy time yeah. um that's everywhere um so i don't know i think if you're going to do beeswax wraps um you really need to come up with something that everybody else in the market's not doing right now because it's 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 quickly getting saturated but um yeah i think that the the opportunity there is to hone in what is what is the ideal version of a beeswax candle is it um is it a tapered, <clears throat> excuse me, is it a tapered candle? Is it a block candle? Is it a votive? And I think coming up, you know, a lot of people who are producing beeswax, you know, the people I see locally at the farmer's markets, most of them are just doing a dipped candle or maybe they've got two or three molds. I think there'd be an opportunity there if someone came up with something very uniquely different in terms of shape, form, presentation, something to do with that i think um i think that could be successful uh are the are the rest of the chat questions um links and things like that greg or are there yeah, any I think, other I think we've addressed any of the other questions i was answering some as they came up um people were just asking for some uh resources uh we just got a question from in asking if one-on-ones were available so yeah we do have we're scheduling those coming up right that's right. So the one-on-ones, uh, if you go to our website, there's a place to register for those. And then we're going to be assessing, you know, who's registered and what and what the needs are. And we'll get back to you probably sometime this week with uh, uh, saying whether or not you're in the program. And then we'll let you schedule those directly with Bernie and Greg so that you can find a time that fits uh, both of you. Um, okay. Aaron, maybe you can remind me, uh, the Saskatchewan government has just announced or announced a few months ago that they were opening trade offices in three countries. And I know one was India and what do you, can you, do you remember the other two? I don't, mm. we were just going through trade, like treaties with um, film industry. So it's not fresh <laughs> for me, Yeah, um, but we can look into that for sure. And the other thing I wanted to commit to was that you and I were going to connect and provide people some resources to, you know, a lot of what Bernie was talking about today, um, Creative Saskatchewan has programming that can help offset some of the expenses for you to attend those markets and showcase your products. So uh, we want to make you aware of that too. So we'll follow up on those things. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Great. Yeah. I know that Bernie, that the trade missions at the provincial government is opening are not are to, you know they're not like uh, Europe and US. One is India. And they're basically more around agriculture and food. Um, right. You know, uh, but but there might be some opportunities there for us since they're opening these offices. So I'll have to check into them and see. Yeah, and then, you know, there's other projects that I didn't even mention, like. London Fashion Week just happened in the UK. We had somebody involved in that. Uh, we had someone happen with, uh, last year we had somebody get stuck initially in London uh, during the COVID lockdown. Uh, we did manage to get her back to Canada in time, but she it was a Halifax based artist that was doing Ceramic Art London, which is an international contemporary ceramic art fair. So, you know, there's, there's tons of things. And I think it's just a matter of, getting plugged into sort of the mechanisms um, to learn about those activities. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Uh, well, unless there's any other questions or um, I think we've come to a close and, you know, good luck with your presentation tomorrow to the commercial great, gallery. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. that'll be interesting for you. I think we, we will have a couple of people from um, the craft council attend that as well. And, uh, so thanks everyone for taking time on your Sunday and your Saturday to join us. We really, um, we really appreciate it. We think it's a good learning curve and certainly as your organization, the Saskatchewan craft council, 
we are going to take a lot of what Bernie and Greg have shared with us under advisement and figure out how to make you become the success you want to be. And so have a great rest of the day and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Bernie. Thanks, Greg. Take care. Thanks, Bye now. Thanks. See ya. Take care.